Welcome to Globis. Uh, my name is Adam Kassab. I'm a faculty member here on the MBA program. Uh, delighted to be here to open this session, the first breakout session at the, the G1 uh, Global. Um, today's session runs from 10.45 until 12, then break for lunch. And let me just introduce the panel um, here talking about soft power diplomacy. So we just had a practice session. I, th I hope I get everyone's names pronounced correctly. Um, so we have uh, delighted to have Seiichi Kondo, Commissioner of uh, Agency for Cultural Affairs. Right. And next to him, uh, Roger Pulvers, who's professor at Tokyo Institute of Technology. Uh, Shinichi Tanaka, president of Fleischmann Hiller Japan. Good morning. And Henry Chicks, who's the economist Tokyo bureau chief. And finally, who's the moderator for the discussion panel is Yoshi Mitsu Kaji, who's a councillor, director of global IT communication strategy at the Prime Minister's office. So, over to you. Thank you very much, everyone, to uh, participate in this uh, session. Uh, as we have discussed, we would like to make it interactive as possible, so you can jump in whenever you'd like. Just raise your hand and state your name then uh, tap into the uh, discussion. That's what we would like to achieve during the session. So, uh, first of all, I would like to start with a brief uh, e explanation about what is soft power. Uh, this uh, quote is from uh, this book, which is written by uh, Joseph Nye from Harvard uh, Kennedy School. So, uh, soft power is the ability to get what you want through attraction rather than coalition or payment. So uh, that is the uh, definition of the, the soft power. It arises from the attractiveness of the country's culture, political ideals, political ideals, that is very important, and uh, policies. It is just like a fall in love with that specific country. You should be reminded that is the point of the soft power. Would you go to the next slide? So this is the, uh, the brief explanation, which gives you a little bit of a clearer idea of the what the uh, soft power is. Uh, there is a, a power, so-called hard power and soft power. If you take a look at the uh, upper side, uh, you can see that some of the actions uh, from the, the left-hand side, uh, which is more harder, uh, command, coalition, and inducement. These are very hard uh, ways of the, the, uh, communicating the, the power of the specific countries. On the other hand, the softer, softer side you, you can see that agenda setting and attractions and cooperations, which is a soft power. And uh, would you go to the next slide? And this slide uh, shows you a uh, more concrete idea of the, uh, what, it, uh, 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 wh what is the soft powers. Uh, there are three uh, kinds of the powers. First one is that uh, clearly the uh, military power. And uh, second one is economic power and soft power in the uh, third column. And if you go uh, the extreme right, you can see the government uh, policies uh, for each uh, sections. Like uh, if you are a country, and the, your country taking the military power, they are uh, taking the uh, initiative like a coalition diplomacy, war, which is an extreme case, and maybe alliances. And for the economic powers, aid and the bribes and sanctions. Aid is like a, a TPP, you are right now saying a very hard topic. And third one is going to be the today's discussion. Uh, public diplomacy, uh, uh, bilateral and multinational diplomacies. So we would like to focus on the right hand side and the uh, lower part of that uh, section. Okay, so uh, let's start with the, uh, uh, the questions to the uh, panelists regarding what we should do. I mean, what Japan should do. Uh, when we say Japan, uh, that includes the government, media, private sector, and uh, so on and on. So I would like to uh, define the ideals or aspirations of what we should do. So uh, I think uh, we should start with uh, Henley. Okay. Hello. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I. Uh, 
when when we look at soft power, I think I should probably start off by just uh, saying what I think soft power is. Um, and and I, I'm speaking as an economist correspondent here. We have a um, we, we, we have a, um, a, a, a sort of a view of soft power which relates to culture. Um, which relates to policy, as, as Joseph Nyders. But I think within The Economist, we probably have a, uh, a slightly harder view of soft power that um, I, I was thinking this morning, it's like a kind of sh shoe cream diplomacy. Mm -hmm. It's soft on the inside, but it's a bit harder on the outside to stop it all splurging out. And the, uh, the idea here really is that, um, and, and what I'm going to talk to you about a little bit wi with regards to Japan, is the economic side of soft power, um, because I think that, that, that that's not a distinct category of diplomacy within Japan. I think they're very closely linked. And just to take Joseph Nye's um, kind of explanation a bit further, what I particularly like about what he says is uh, he says that in the information age, the country with some of the best soft power is actually the country with the best story to tell. And that, to me, is, I think, a good point to start the discussion about where Japan should go with regards to soft power, because really, Japan's story, um, at least, um, well, both internally and externally, is problematic. Uh, we heard you were all at the uh, the session this morning. Um, the words that crop up are crisis, challenge. Um, there's the Ds. There's you know deflation, debt, demography, democracy. Even in Japan, is considered a problem. Um, and uh, and this um, and, and 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 this is a story that's particularly um, kind of deadening to the outside world. Um, and, uh, and it's also a, uh, a, a story that I think is driven internally. It's a story that comes from within Japan. Um, it's not necessarily a story that the outside world wants to hear, but uh, externally the problem is now, as again we heard this morning, that you know, Europe and America are kind of being considered to have the Japanese disease now, uh, turning Japanese, as we put it in a cover story the other day. Um, and that just kind of reinforces this sense that things are pretty gloomy about Japan these days. And that gloominess is deadly dull. It's, as a journalist, it's really difficult to sell a story about, the, about this country because of that. So I'm going to kind of play a, a little thought exercise, mind game, if you like, with you. Play a bit of a devil's adv advocacy. Um, and I don't do this um, you know, completely abstractly. I do this because actually, ever since I came to Japan, I thought, hang on, those three Ds and that sense of gloom doesn't really fit with the country that I see in front of me. So I did a little bit of research. Um, and uh, as some of you will, will object to this, but you know, let's just look at Japan from another way, shall we? Let's look at the country that over the last 10 years has grown more in GDP per capita than America. That's Japan. Oh, GDP per capita, you might say. What's so, what's so important about GDP per capita? The importance is to have a big aggregate growth rate. Well, no, not in a country with a shrinking population. In a country with a shrinking population, it's very difficult to talk about thumping great growth. Um, it's much more important to talk about GDP per capita, which in a sense Japan has managed to sustain despite the population growth. And that's because that shrinking population is working pretty hard, which is why labor productivity per hour in Japan over the last 10 years has, also has vastly exceeded Europe and is pretty much close to where Japan, Japan was. Then let's take that, um, that ballooning debt that we're all really worried about, right? You know, Japan, the biggest debtor in the world. No, Japan is not the biggest debtor in the world. Japan has the biggest government debt, perhaps. But Japan, funnily enough, is the richest country in the world when it comes to assets, right? Why don't we ever hear this? Why don't we hear that the corollary to a big government deficit is a corporate and a household sector that's phenomenal? nominally wealthy, right? Okay, that money is sitting in bank accounts and whatever um, and is not 
being moved around the country, but the money is there. So let's stop. I mean, when we're talking crisis, we're, th you know, when, uh, as, as Nick mentioned downstairs, you know, you look at Greece, that's crisis. Mm. You look at Japan, it doesn't feel like <laughs> crisis really here. And just to kind of cut, um, cut it short, this is, I mean, you know, deflation again. Deflation is a curse. Yes, no one likes deflation except for the elderly. Oh. Right? Japan's an elderly country. It's kind of convenient to have prices going down and to have real interest rates that are positive. Oh, okay, sorry. Henry, uh, please focus on the, uh, the softer part. Oh, sorry, I'm uh, going over. Okay, yes. Uh, sorry, you I'm might really be going in a, a so different. Anyway, uh, maybe maybe session. Yes, session. Sorry, maybe. to come back. To it's so not so a, a I, I'm very sorry. So, so basically, the point that I the, the point that I really want to make is that if Japan conveys not just a different story externally mm. but a different story internally it will start to waken people up as to japan's kind of what japan has done really well over the last decade or so which has been a decade of quite important reforms and i think that once it does that it will be easier for japan mm. to project itself as as, as, as Mr. Furukawa said, on the front line of certain, um, you know, front line of aging, front line of energy, um, it can basically push forward the message that it's not a country that's sliding down the scale. It's a country that's really on the forefront, and you have to look at Japan and take it seriously, and you can let it influence your standards and the kind of economic developments over the next 10 years or 20 years mm -hmm. that are going to be very important in Asia mm -hmm. and the rest of the world. Sorry, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, that I think solely is a very critical word to depict our situations and our, our potentials. Thank you very much for providing that, that very thoughtful ideas. So, uh, Tan Tanaka-san, what do you think about what Japan should do to <laughs> leverage the soft power? Well, I think uh, what Henry said, I do agree. If we look uh, from a, another perspective about Japan issue, uh, I do see uh, a huge potential. Japan to become one of the major uh, nation of soft power. Uh, and uh, I think it's very important for Japan to be uh, a major nation of soft power, especially in this region. Because it's not just sake of Japan, but it's the sake of the world. Because uh, this region, Asia, which is a growing sector in the world, needs stability. And for Japan to really have a very uh, strong positioning within this region really helps stabilize uh, this region. And I think soft power is going to be the key. Uh, but there are issues, uh, because I see three issues which Japan has to overcome to really strengthen their uh, soft power. Uh, one is uh, interpretation of Japan value. I mean, Japanese value doesn't automatically uh, kind of interpret self themselves uh, in a different uh, non-Japan context. And uh, it is very important that uh, we have to interpret uh, Japan, cult uh, Japan uh, value within a different context, in the global context, if I may say. Uh, for example, I do tea ceremonies. It's one of my favorite uh, uh, practice. And uh, many of my friends, foreign friends, do show strong interest in tea ceremony. But uh, gaining interest is not enough. You have to make sure that uh, they feel uh, that uh, to the level that experience from tea ceremony uh, does have a contribute to their daily life. It has to, they have to feel the benefit, the actual benefit of the experience from the tea ceremony. So I think uh, ben uh, benefit and also contribution is really the key components of uh, translating Japan value to the world. Uh, so that's this how we should interpret or translate Japan value to the world is going to be very crucial. That's one issue. The second issue, I think, is uh, communication. How to communicate uh, Japan value. Uh, the universe of uh, communication is uh, dramatically changing these days. If I may uh, describe uh, this change in keywords is uh, from awareness to respect. Uh, creating awareness is not going to be enough anymore. You have to build respect. Uh, the second keyword is uh, from uh, uh, visibility to credibility. Uh, just creating visibility is not going to be enough. You have to build uh, the credibility. 
and to build respect and credibility as my profession is communication, indirect communication is go going to become more and more important. What I mean by indirect communication is you have to send your message through respected, credible third-party influences. Uh, this has much higher uh, communication leverage than direct communications. Uh, it's extremely important that networking, uh, relationship building, is going to be more and more important than sending your message, one-way message, through mass media. So uh, I think this, uh, uh, like for example, this uh, global G1 uh, meeting is really very important because I do agree Davos Conference does play an important ro uh, role these days in building relationship and networking. But also we have to think about uh, having Japan's own platform uh, to make sure that Japan will get uh, linked with the world. And I think this uh, uh, global G1 conference really serves that pro uh, this uh, uh, purpose. And I think uh, I do look forward that this activity is going to grow more in, in France. Now the third point actually is global mindset. I think uh, in the past uh, two decades, Japan has lost gradually its global mindset. Uh, the good example I always use is uh, this comparison between uh, a very well-known Japan pop idol group, AKB48, and also compared with uh, this uh, uh, girls' generation, Shoujo Jidai, the Korean uh, idol uh, pop group. It is quite clear that uh, AKB48 uh, was developed targeting only Japanese market. But the girls' generation is not. They are not targeting only Korea. They're targeting Asia from uh, the beginning of its development. Now that's the big difference. I think Korea has much stronger global mindset uh, than Japan. Japan needs to uh, reinvent the wheel, definitely. We have to focus how to develop global mindset. So uh, basically to really Japan to uh, strengthen its uh, uh, soft power, it is very important that we deal with the three issues how to uh, interpret uh, Japan value to the world, second, how to communicate uh, to build respect and credibility to the world, and third is how we can develop uh, the glo global mindset in Japan. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. So it is like a very good combination. Uh, so in that sense, uh, we have to uh, define the story, then we would need to uh, broaden it and translate it and maybe that uh, with the uh, global mindset. That might be the uh, learning uh, from uh, two uh, wise persons. So uh, would you go, uh, may I go to uh, Roger? Yeah, Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted that you've come here to this important uh, session instead of going to one of those insignificant ones about e economics and politics. Um, <coughs> at no time since the early Meiji era has the impact of Japanese culture on the world been so insignificant and feeble as now, as the era of Heisei? Why is that? Uh, in the Meiji period, as many of you know, there was a tremendous uh, burgeoning of Japanese culture, which was when Japan was discovered uh, by Western Europe, Eastern Europe, the United States, and also China. Uh, there was a tremendous influx of people in, uh, into Japan from those areas, and also uh, a tremendous enthusiasm about Japanese culture, which and Japanese the influence of Japanese culture in all the arts was phenomenal. <coughs> uh, unfortunately, that led to a very pernicious kind of uh, fascism in this country, which uh, during the late Taisho and early Showa periods snuffed out all of that wonderful culture, or virtually all of it. And it wasn't until after the war that we saw the second wave of, of a similar impact on, uh, not quite as big as, as in Meiji, but the post-war uh, culture of Japan, also particularly in film, later in theater, certainly in design, uh, and all of the related fields, uh, media fields as well, made a, had a tremendous impact. The, two, the, the guiding principle in both of those very different eras, because Meiji was, was, turned out to be a rather orthodox era and the post-war was uh, one of decadence and um, uh, what's called the buraiha, the, the writers of that era were uh, 
very anti-establishment. But the, the, the common thread that ran through both of them is what, what could be called hangyaku no seishin, the spirit of rebellion, which existed very strongly, which doesn't exist, unfortunately, in Japan today. Uh, this is what's necessary in Japan. Instead, as a, as a symbol of uh, the Japanese era of the Heisei period, we have the Tamagotchi, which uh, very much uh, uh, is the perfect symbol for uh, uh, not only the young generation, but the old generation, because the fault lies with my generation, not with the young people. Perfect symbol of, of how uh, Japanese people prefer to communicate <coughs> uh, in, this, in this day. Now, I, I coined some, some time ago, I coined a, a, a phrase to describe Japanese culture in the Heisei period. That fra that it's a word, actually. It's mask. And mask stands for manga, anime, sushi, and karaoke. And this, I think, uh, the, uh, the entire contemporary culture of Japan, uh, as far as it's seen from the outside world, can be summed up in this one word. Uh, unfortunately, tamagotchi doesn't really get in there, but I think we can add that on as well. Uh, if we look at those things, the manga and the anime boom have, uh, were totally unexploited by Japanese in, the ter in terms of entrepreneurship. I don't think Japan made very much money at all uh, on this, on these great creations from Japan. Sushi, if you go to uh, my country, uh, Australia, and you walk around and see a lot of sushi bars, they're all run by Koreans. Uh, uh, and uh, karaoke, I think people around the world love karaoke, but I don't think anybody would really associate that with Japan. Japan, we'll get right into it, Japan needs a very uh, strong uh, policy of cultur cultural entrepreneurship, the ability to understand what is universal and valuable in this country, which has always been a problem for the Japanese, and the, and the added ability to transmit that into, into commerce. Uh, I think the great model of this is the United States of America. Um, the United States do doesn't always uh, expropriate its own culture, it expropriates everybody else's. So the U.S. has given the world pizza, the taco, and believe it or not, coffee. You know, when I, I used to be an American, and when I lived in the United States, one of the worst things about the United States was you couldn't get a decent cup of coffee. Uh, I, I don't know, I s if you go to Starbucks, you still can't get one. <laughs> but that, that's, a, that's a different story. But uh, how, the, how the U.S. took these, these uh, cultural phenomena from other places, expropriated them and sold them to the world, is what Japan should be doing, at least with its own culture. Um, I think, finally, because uh, and we'll get into some, some more details later on, uh, one of the classic mottos of the, of the Meiji period was one that the leaders of Meiji took from the Mitohang from the late 1830s, and that is Fukoku Kyohei, uh, build a strong country by strengthening the military. But what is necessary in Japan in 2011 is fukoku kyoge, to build a strong country by strengthening art and culture. And the realization that culture does not ride on the back of economics and economic uh, prosperity. It's the other way around. And we should be considering ways to make, to prioritize the the uh, development of Japanese culture and the, and the transmission of Japanese culture to the world as if it were defense. I think we should be spending as much money on culture as we spend on defense, 1.5% 1, 1 of GDP. Now, I doubt that, th that uh, this country is going to do that. But uh, until we do that, and until Japanese people recognize the immense value of this culture to the world, then I think not all of the economists in the world, not all of the clever politicians in the world are going to be able to revitalize this country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very insightful uh, perspective. So uh, last of all, uh, Kondo -san, Commissioner Kondo is going to attach up on the perspective from government. Okay, uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, having spent uh, nearly 40 years as a diplomat and now a head of a cultural agency, I have uh, been involved in sort of soft power diplomacy uh, quite a bit. And uh, maybe because of that, I'm uh, always a bit hesitant to talk openly about the strategies of soft power diplomacy, because it has to be kept secret. <laughs> it a sec should be a secret weapon. But uh, 
given the circumstances, I, I will do my best. Um, the, um, let me talk about uh, the sources of the strength of Japanese culture or soft power. I think uh, compared to uh, the, the, the so-called the West or the Western civilization, uh, one of the characteristics of our culture is association with nature. Uh, we think we are part of nature, whereas in the West, humans are supposed to be superior to nature. Therefore, humans are allowed to exploit nature for the benefit of, of, of ourselves. And this contributed to the uh, great civilization, uh, science and technologies, and we are now living a very comfortable, physically comfortable life. Whereas in Japan, um, uh, we are a part of nature. Uh, some people talk about uh, symbiosis with nature or coexistence with nature. I don't like those words because symbiosis or coexistence mean that you are different, two different things. You have to live together. No, we are on a part of nature. So my right arm and myself do not coexist because my right arm is a part of myself. So I think uh, uh, our philosophy, traditional philosophy, because of the uh, climate and other geographical uh, 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 circumstances, is that we consider ourselves as part of nature. Therefore, after the great earthquakes and tsunami in Tohoku, people were, in a sense, receptive of the situation. They, they did not show their angers. They, they just accepted uh, these, uh, those uh, calamities as a reality. And they stood, uh, stood up, they uh, hand in hand with others, uh, uh, start uh, uh, waiting for the benefits nature will give later in the springtime. So we have been considering ourselves as part of nature, which is potentially a source of strength. And this is a, this uh, uh, g gave gave birth to the what the Tanaka-san called uh, Japan value: the discipline, respect for others, respect for nature. Uh, those are still abstract, but uh, all the cultural power we have expressed now in anime or mask uh, that uh, Roger said is based on this philosophy. So this is, uh, in my view, the, uh, the sources, one of the sources of Japanese uh, cultural strength. Now, how to project this? How to transmit this value to attract uh, other people? Well, um, given the nature of soft power, which is unpredictable, uh, it, it is very difficult to establish causal relationship, you know, input and output. Unlike uh, uh, launching a missile, you can, you can predict what kind of uh, power it will give to the, to the target, targeted uh, uh, castle or whatever. But uh, soft power, you cannot predict anything. Uh, it may have uh, adversary impact. So uh, my uh, uh, policy is for the government is to clear ways for free flow of cultural expressions, people, and maybe to create favorable environment for cultural exchanges, leaving the impact to be to, to the power of culture itself, the attraction of culture or philosophy behind it itself. And also, um, uh, I agree with uh, the previous speakers. Uh, I think uh, in order for this to work, uh, to operate uh, uh, more effectively, we have to regain confidence in ourselves. We have lost so much in uh, confidence, and uh, in spite of all the cultural assets, cultural properties, all the good uh, philosophies which fit the 21st century, we are not using those sources effectively. So what I'm doing, I have been doing in the last 14 months since I got this current job, is to talk to the Japanese people, including young people, that we have such a good sources of, of uh, cultural power. We are, have not realized that in the daily life. Um, so to giving confidence uh, to the people. And if we, are, we have become more confident, then automatically, the power of culture and our, our philosophy will go out if you clear the way for smooth interaction. Um, and of course, we do need communi communicative skills 
we have been uh, too modest in promoting ourselves, projecting ourselves. This is a older new agenda for the Japanese. I agree with Tonaka-san that we have to, uh, to develop more uh, communica communicative skills. But what is more important is that we ourselves recognize the strength of our culture and, and the philosophy. Thank you very much. Very much. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Professor Palvas, you have some observations uh, regarding the uh, uh, fundamental strengths which uh, Kondosa mentioned. I think you might have uh, some insights on that. Yeah, well, thank you. <coughs> well, I've over the last 44 years in Japan, I've spent a lot of time in Tohoku, particularly studying the works of Miyazawa Kenji, who's from Iwate Prefecture. And I've just spent five days up in Iwate. Uh, including Rikuzen Takata with an NHK team making some television programs about it. And what struck me really very, very strongly this time, because it was my first trip uh, to the disaster area since um, March, is that Tohoku needs to reinvent itself as a sep almost as a separate entity uh, from Japan. I think of the wonderful book by my very close friend who died last year, Ino Isashi, called Kiri Kiri Jin. And in that book, a, part, uh, a little town in Tohoku actually declared independence from Japan. Now, I think that uh, with the commissioner here, I don't, I don't dare say that Tohoku should become independent. But Tohoku should become a little bit like Scotland and uh, realize that it has a unique culture and uh, do what I call LBT, and that's look beyond Tokyo or even do, uh, go all the way and do LBJ and say, look beyond Japan. And I think this is the, it, uh, traditionally, uh, Tohoku, particularly before the war, has sent its men to Tokyo as soldiers, its women to Tokyo as prostitutes, and its rice to Tokyo. And since the, since the nuclear era, we can add its energy to Tokyo. And for this, Tokyo, uh, the to people of Tohoku generally earned the reputation in uh, among some in some circles in central Japan, as or this part of Japan, Kanto, as being donkusai, sort of thick, and akanuketenai, you know, unrefined, and so on. And then all of a sudden, on March 11th, everybody's saying, oh, aren't these people wonderful? They're resilient and stoic, and they're the soul and spirit of Japan. Well, it reminds me of the way the Jews were treated at one particular time. And I'd like to say, you must be more wary of your friends than your enemies uh, at some time. And Tohoku should become an, uh, regionally and culturally independent from Japan and not take as much aid from Tokyo and from the central government as it can get. But if it relies on this, then it's going to go back to its old role. Uh, it should become part of, it should identify itself with other countries in Asia, particularly East Asia, uh, Korea, China, Mongolia, also Southeast Asia, Vietnam, and India, bring students from there. There are tremendous, there's tr there are tremendous universities in, in Tohoku. The, the nature, as Kondo-san has talked about, is, is unique anywhere in, J in Japan. Uh, there can be a cultural revival. There should be flights from, from, from Hanamaki to, to Seoul, to Busan, to Ulaanbaatar, instead of always going through Narita or going through Haneda. And until we do this, not only in Tohoku, but in all the regions, until Japan realizes that its real culture is not in the center. The, the culture of Tokyo, the culture of Edo was like Oyakodonburi. You know, it had rice underneath, which came from the countryside, and then it just put on elements from all, everywhere else, and it just went zuru, 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 zuru into the rice, and everybody thought it was wonderful. And that's terrific, and it's oishi, and you stand up and you eat it in five minutes and you're finished. But the real culture, is in what I call the kokunai ibunka, this domestic, diff different cultures from domest on a domestic level. And the regions should be encouraged by the central government to have an independence, cultural independence from, uh, uh, from the rest of Japan so that we don't start every sentence with nihonjin wa, the Japanese. And you say, yeah, so you say, no, no, we can't say that. Everybody's different. The variety in this country of is, is, is stunning. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe and Western Europe in my life, Australia and the United States. And there's no country with the cultural variety, uh, particularly cla in, in all sorts of classic f classical fields, uh, also in modern, in design, as there is in this country. But it's stifled because people are too reliant on the central government. So as far as something very concrete in terms of soft power is, 
decentralize, take a regional approach to culture, and trust, trust the people in the countryside. And in that sense, you're reversing the Meiji model, which, which stifled uh, l local cultures, stifled hogeng dialects. You know, we should, have, we should have the NHK news in Kansai Beng. So at the end, they say, Okini at the end, instead <laughs> of, uh, no Hyojungo. Get rid of Hyojungo. Out. And have uh, uh, recognized that this is one of the most uh, pluralistic, culturally pluralistic countries in the world. Hi. Awarimashita. Hi. Thank you. It looks like a, we have uh, some uh, uh, strengths, which is maybe that we uh, bear, uh, very, uh, very strong in terms of the uh, awareness of the we are part of nature or something like that. But it looks like we are kind of uh, uh, currently underleveraged. Is that true? So I'd like to uh, uh, let you late that performance of Japanese nation as a whole about the uh, uh, level, uh, level of the uh, utilization of the soft power and how should we overcome that uh, 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 ch challenges and uh, uh, more uh, uh, utilizing that more, uh, that soft power. So, so would you late the uh, uh, current? Well, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Henley? Mm -hmm. uh, Tanaka-san? Okay. Mm -hmm. sure. How do you like uh, I was very impressed with Rogers on uh, this uh, analogy and this uh, abbreviation. It's, it's so, <laughs> it's great. And I, I'm going to pick on that. Uh, I was very impressed with three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but there was uh, this Fukuku Kyoge. I think this is very interesting. And uh, yes, art, culture. Uh, also, as uh, Kondo-san had mentioned, uh, I think Japan has a, a strength, a very strong strength. And it is very important, as Kondo-san says, the Japanese should recognize that strength immediately. But also, it was very interesting, because it's not just culture and art. I think uh, uh, we also have knowledge and experience. Uh, for example, like in uh, uh, public health care, in public health, Japan's uh, infant death rate is the lowest in the world. Uh, why? Because of uh, very advanced uh, public health. Now, this itself is a knowledge and the experience that Japan can share with the world and uh, contribute uh, to, the, uh, to the world. And this itself, I think, is also one source of uh, uh, soft power. And the same thing could be done with uh, uh, this disaster uh, prevention. Uh, in many developing countries, that's still a big issue. And in some cases, uh, in advanced country too. I think Japan has the most accumulated uh, knowledge and experience on natural disaster. So these, I think, in addition to culture and uh, things, I think knowledge and experience that Japan has is also a very important source for strengthening our uh, soft power. Now the second word which I liked was uh, LBJ which is uh, look beyond Japan. Uh, and I do agree that m maybe we should uh, really seriously discuss uh, making East Japan independent. Uh, because I do see uh, there are four growth engines in Asia. Uh, one is China, second is India, third is ASEAN. But I think East Japan is going to be one of the growth engines in Asia. Uh, because uh, as Furukawa-san has said this morning, uh, Japan is committed, I hope it's committed, uh, government is committed to reshape, redesign that area. It's going to be, uh, if they can do that, it does provide a huge opportunity to uh, Eastern Japan. And uh, I think, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, for example, the experience that Fukushima had, I think that is not just a Japan experience. It's an experience for the world. We have to share that uh, Fukushima experience to the world in terms of safety of nuclear power, uh, in terms of renewable energy, in terms of uh, uh, kind of dealing with this uh, uh, ra radiation uh, contaminations, rebuilding the c uh, community. All these experience is very valuable uh, to the world. And by sharing that, I think uh, the soft power of Japan is going to be really strengthened. Now, the third word that I was very impressed too is this uh, kokunai ibunka. Uh, I think diversity is really the strength of uh, soft power. 
Uh, many people perceive Japan as a kind of homogeneous, unified society. I don't think so. Because uh, I always use the example that in Japan, there is eight million gods living. <laughs> Yara yorozu no kami. Okay? There's no country which has 800 gods living in this. So you can see how Japan is so diversified. And I do agree uh, that this diversity uh, is going to be uh, one of the uh, strong component of strengthening Japanese soft power. So you th uh, it, it looks like you have been uh, raising a uh, lots of potentials. So you think it's still underleveraged, right? Well, I just I, I certainly don't want to take from anybody else's mm -hmm. time, but just uh, I don't think the politicians, with all due respect to the ones who are here this morning, really trust the Japanese people. Mm. Uh, the Jap uh, the, it's said that the Japanese people are, you know, have to take responsibility and that sort of thing. I don't think they trust the, uh, them to, to really have power and to, to express themselves in an independent way. And until they, the, the central power, the powers that be let go and let a hundred flowers bloom, then it's just not going to happen. I'm sorry, it's, we're just going to end here and we're going to say, oh, that's, those are good ideas and we'll have more committees and task forces and everybody will say, yes, that's what we should do and nothing's going to change. So I, I, I'm optimistic about the, the diversity of Japan and, and the Japanese people coming to grips with that, but not, uh, not particularly with the, the political uh, situation, the, pol the politicians actually tr trusting uh, people in the regions to take uh, power into their own hands. Can, can I just make a point um, adding to what Ro Roger and Tanaka said? Um, has said. Um, I don't think that uh, it's just uh, cultural diversity uh, that is Japan's great strength in the regions. Uh, I think it's economic diversity as well, and sorry to hark back to, to, to this, um, but one of the things that's um, surprised not just me, but I think even the government itself, is how much economic power there was even in a place like Tohoku, which was considered to be you know, the, the sort of um, the, the backyard, if you like, of Tokyo. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I once did a chart looking, comparing the economic power of all the different regions of Japan with countries around the world. And you know, Tohoku has the same economic size as Argentina, for example, Kyushu as Norway. You know, it was, it's quite impressive what there is. And yet, you know, I remember straight after March the 11th, um, S one, one former government official standing up and saying, you know, who knew that we had such vital components of the world's supply chain in Tohoku? So I would like to just kind of reinforce the point that's made that liberating these areas in a sense, w I, I don't think necessarily that means de declaring unilaterally d unilateral independence, but I do think that there are many ways that Tokyo can liberalize these areas and let them choose their own direction. That direction in Tohoku, for example, may be in terms of tourism. I mean, it's an absolutely beautiful region. I've been backwards and forwards to there since March the 11th. Last week, I spent um, a day or more in the no-go zone in Fukushima. And it was like being in the Lake District in the UK. You know, And you just think the tragedy of this place, which now people can't go back to their homes. Um, I would like to just make one point related to what Kondo-san said that I think diminishes, in a sense, Japan's soft power. Japan has a tremendous power of attraction, or could have a tremendous power of attraction, based around this issue of nature and the Japanese relationship with nature, which is truly extraordinary and, and is one of the most exciting things that I find as a foreigner being here. And yet, God, does Japan ruin its nature when it gets the chance? I mean, you know, the, the, I mean, not just through exploding nuclear power plants, but electricity pylons all over the place, really bad housing. And it just seems to me, if Tohoku, for example, wanted to create a more, if it wanted to project itself, it could project itself by making itself really beautiful and attracting lots of people from, from the outside world. So 
that's really the point relating to, to Tohoku. And just to kind of make it broader and very quickly, I would like to say that as a result of March the 11th, the world did kind of look at this as being the trigger point for Japan to change and to embrace some of these kind of reforms. And I think if Japan fluffs that opportunity, then there will be a, hu a, a collective sort of sigh of despair from the outside world if it misses the opportunity. So uh, that kind of thank you. So Kondo -san, please. Um, uh, a couple of points on, on what uh, has been discussed. Um, I think uh, we have to free ourselves from the neg uh, negative legacy of Meiji government and uh, growth, economic growth oriented policies of uh, uh, post World War II. And those policies were successful in preventing ourselves from being colonized or in standing up from the ash of the World War II. But because of this, this big success, we have failed to, to make a transition to the new stage. Therefore, we are suffering from the negative uh, uh, aspects of those uh, two basic policies. Realism, economic growth, too much orientation on economic growth. Therefore, we have forgotten the values we have inherited from our ancestors, like uh, uh, respect for nature, res respect for others, and uh, you know the efficiency, growth, those are important, yes, but uh, we need to re-establish re the balance between what can be calculated, what can be uh, 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 quantified, and, uh, and the qualitative uh, values Japan we have inherited uh, from, from ancestors. And uh, that is why, uh, um, as uh, uh, Henry said, or Tanaka-san said, uh, uh, what we see in, in big cities or current Japan is uh, uh, the destruction of nature and also um, uh, uh, too much orientation to tangible results out of the today's investment. Uh, we have had uh, traditionally a long-term view of dealing with uh, 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 the problems, but because of the uh, uh, shiwake uh, operations, um, we have a great, great tendency of asking for results tomorrow uh, of what you do today, which is killing the the good values of, of Japan that, uh, that has been inherited. Thank you. Thank you very much. So are there any points from other participants okay. or advices? Okay. Well, one thing very specific, which uh, I'm sure Kondo-san is very, very aware of and certainly in favor of, is the necessity to teach people around the world the Japanese language. I believe in Nihongo no Teiko Kushugi the imperialism of the Japanese language. And there's, there seems to still seems to be a viewpoint which is slightly, uh, over the last 40 years, uh, softened that Western, that non-Japanese can't really understand Japanese. And I mean, even some years ago, uh, even up to a few years ago, the teachers would teach a, a foreigner how to write kanji. And then when the foreigner wrote the kanji, the teacher would go, ha, like that, you know, and <laughs> be surprised that they could write it, you know. And uh, the Japanese is a kind of code, and it's and it's aimai, it's ambiguous, and we don't really, un you know, it's the ishin denshin and all that stuff about telepathy. That's a bunch of codswallop. It's rubbish. And uh, we really need to uh, spend a huge amount of money, hundreds of millions of dollars in 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 dollar terms, on the uh, teaching the Japanese language. Uh, subsidizing institutes, universities, schools, programs to get the, the, um, the foreign world to realize the beauty of this language and the importance of knowing the language uh, for the true understanding of the depth of Japanese culture. So is that soft power, Kondo-san? Can, uh, yeah. okay. can I just, um, c I, I just wondered, wondered with, um, from what Kondo-san was saying, um, that uh, if we're talking about soft power here, so we're talking about the international projection of these values, where I have a problem with, um, I with, the, with this kind of discussion is, so how does this get projected abroad? You know, the Japanese, I mean, uh, personally, I didn't know 
very much about Japanese culture before I arrived here. And it's been a revelation, uh, a, you know, a wonderful revelation. But it, it, it's th there seems to be the need for certain kind of concrete mileposts, if you like, for trying to convince the, uh, well, not just trying to convince, but just to sell Japanese culture to the outside world. And one of the, the I, I mean, this is probably a very poor and particularly economisty type of um, example, but one of the things that I did think I, um, after March the 11th, and I continue to think, is that you know, energy reform and renewables, the use of renewables, putting a country's fantastic brain power behind that sort of push, as part of a way of saying, our culture, going back to Edo, has been a culture of sustainability. We can do this. You know, that's quite a good way of projecting something to the outside world that maybe the outside world doesn't realize, because what the outside world sees of Japan is as a massive electricity guzzling place, because the neon lights are always on. I mean, you know, to, not, not in a bad sense, but they see the lights they don't see that old that 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 love of nature that you mentioned. Uh, th thank you very much. I I think it's a very relevant point, and also that that uh, given uh, uh, that Furukawa-san mentioned that we are the front runner for the emerging issues in globally. So I think those kind of uh, renewable energy or the sustainability might be the uh, learning we have built uh, through the long era, and we have to uh, convey to the world by uh, uh, as, uh, interpreting in a good way, maybe in English. So I think it's a, g a great uh, approach. Uh, one thing I would like to uh, mention is, uh, because I was working for the private sector, then I uh, tapped into the uh, public sector this January. My observation is that uh, since that economical growth uh, driven, uh, as uh, Kondo-san uh, pointed out, the situation totally changed, but the, the government started to uh, uh, transform, actually. So, uh, for example, we should, uh, uh, the web page of the Agati Times. This is one of the example of the, uh, the diversification and the decentralization because that, uh, this event is going to be tomorrow and this is driven by uh, METI. The uh, METI used to uh, do uh, their own, uh, their, uh, those kind of uh, events. But Kondo-san will be invited that uh, session and the uh, commission Commissioner of the uh, Tourism Agency will be there as well. So that uh, even the government started to become flatter and more uh, broader and uh, interlinked and uh, interdependent and also collaborations. So I think it's a, a good hint of the uh, trans uh, transition of Japanese government as well. Uh, actually, the Kondo-san is the uh, counter person of the, uh, these uh, transitions. And I think, and also the Umezawa-san has been kicking the government's uh, uh, METI uh, to drive this uh, 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 project. And uh, this is a combination of the automobile industry, design, fashions, and animations, and those kind of things. Uh, I think those kind of interrelation and interdependability and also the decentralization is going to drive that uh, one of the key to drive the Japanese uh, value to the world. Okay, so, Kondo uh, Santos. <coughs> Uh, again, a couple of, of points uh, or a couple of difficulties we face in doing what we have been talking about. First, it is diff very difficult to change the mindset of the people. Um, as I said, uh, we have been so su successful in defending ourselves from uh, Western colo colonial powers and also uh, uh, we were uh, praised as Japan as number one um, in, in the uh, several decades after the war. Um, still, you know, uh, after two decades of uh, stagnation, still we have a mindset that we have to grow. Every, all the resources should be put for economic growth. Um, so uh, although some intellectuals are talking about different things, but still people's mindset is, is still there. It takes some more time. And secondly, uh, uh, the promotion of ourselves, presenting or projecting our values is not something we are very good at. Because of our respect for nature, we have, we have a tendency of leaving everything to nature. Uh, be being natural, shizentai, is a good thing for Japan. 
for 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 in, in a value system. So I was brought up by my mother, don't promote yourself. If you are doing good things, well, the world will eventually appreciate you. That is the culture we have. So he here's a dilemma. We have good values, but uh, that prevents us from projecting ourselves to the world, which is necessary uh, to be done in this uh, very competitive world. So tho those are two uh, difficulties we are facing. How to overcome those difficulties is, uh, is uh, the core of the problem. Quick point, about a minute. I absolutely agree with you, uh, Mr. Kondo, but there have been people, even w in the culture of uh, the traditional culture of Japan, who have not done, not as self promotion, but as promotion of Japanese culture, been very aggressive and very articulate. Okakura Tenshin, Harakawa Seshu, Takamine Jokichi, Kumagusu, you know, uh, as well, Minakata Kumagusu. I mean, these, m these people promoted Japan overseas, were very successful overseas, and, on, on, and in many cases then were looked down upon in Japan as a kind of kokujoku, uh, that we don't really uh, approve of these people going and being successful overseas. This is what has to change. Do we don't want people to become arrogant again like they did in the 1930s. But if you have something good, you should tell the world about it. Why not? I think uh, the Shizentai, uh, I do understand that. And I think uh, don't promote yourself is, very, uh, is some kind of a cultural thing that we have. But I think that's now becoming an advantage rather than disadvantage from a uh, communication point of view. Because as I work for a, a kind of a US uh, a strategic communication consulting firm, uh, I do feel a limit in the Western way of communicating with people. And I think Shizentai communication is going to become more and more important. You don't promote yourself, but you let other people talk about you. That indirect communication is becoming extremely important. Uh, to share, to get empathy, uh, it's becoming very, very important. So I would rather think Shizentai is, uh, w uh, could be one of the strengths for, uh, for Japan in the software. Uh, I mean, soft power. Now, I have uh, uh, also a very interesting uh, comment Kondo-san made is, it's very difficult to change people's mindset. As my profession is to really change people's <laughs> mindset, <laughs> I do have uh, uh, comments on that too. <laughs> but I, d I see two opportunities, or challenge, I would say, uh, could drive and change people's mindset uh, within the next five to 10 years. And one is the outbound opportunities. Uh, now, in the world, I think f my personal uh, cum uh, calculation is probably there is about 10,000 uh, companies which is qualified to operate globally. Now, my calculation says probably 40 to 50 percent of those companies will come from Japan. And uh, in the past two decades, of course, people might say, uh, you know, we, uh, we kind of lost our identity. But at the same time, the Japanese market was so sufficient enough to feed everybody. So there were many companies became big during that two, uh, two decades uh, under a uh, uh, aggressive competition. And they are prepared. They have good quality product. They have a good business model. Uh, they have money. And now they are moving out from Japan or actually becoming more global. Now this is going to put a huge pressure on Japanese uh, many companies have to, as I said, will be forced to communicate or to interpret their values. Many uh, uh, companies will be forced to communicate their values. Many uh, companies will be uh, forced to, uh, they have to have a global mindset. So I think this outbound opportunity is going to put a huge pressure and force Japanese to change their mindset. Uh, the second uh, opportunity or challenge is inbound opportunity, I think, which is uh, East Japan, especially like Fukushima. Uh, I think uh, uh, Fukushima is not a geographical name anymore. It symbolizes all the issues uh, which the world is going to face. And as uh, uh, Kaji-san mentioned and also Furukawa-san mentioned that Japan is going to be a forefronter, for front runner, I think the key word that Henry-san mentioned is sustainability. Uh, if we can make uh, the name Fukushima uh, to symbolize or represent uh, as a, a symbol of uh, sustainability or social sustainability, that can really uh, brand or position Japan. 
And uh, the experience, as I mentioned before, the experience of, uh, of Fukushima is extremely important. We have to make sure that we share those with the world and make uh, Japan contributing to that area. And once that becomes more and more obvious, I think the Japanese people will realize uh, that uh, they do have a strength. So I think, uh, as I say, there are two drivers. One is outbound opportunity, more Japanese company moving out, which will have uh, uh, a pressure to uh, changing Japanese mindset. But also, we do have Fukushima in-house, uh, which could uh, become a symbol of the new uh, uh, soft power of Japan. Uh, th thank you very much, very thoughtful uh, insights. And I'd like to touch upon just one thing. Uh, uh, th this is the chat uh, which will be shown at the G20. My colleague is going to present at the G20. Look at that. Uh, there are lots of issues in the globally, like a crisis in Europe finance and Arab Springs and uh, maybe natural disasters. And I do think that Japan should communicate and take a lead. As uh, Furukawa-san said, that, that we are the front liner and we experience the disaster and we have to uh, convey this experience to the world, which is much, much broader than the soft powers. So I would like to get back to the soft power a little bit. Have you seen this newspaper today? Asahi newspaper. <laughs> Japanese government, go Hallyu. <laughs> so so the next, uh, this session is going to be covered by uh, Umezawa-san uh, uh, this afternoon. So stay tuned. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.